I think for newer writers, if something is well written, it's easy to read. And so it should feel it feels like, well, it should be easy to write. And it's not. In fact, the better it is, probably the harder it is to write. I was thinking about this, and, and athletes have taught us very well that being an athlete is difficult, and they have to practice, and they do things. And, you know, it's not like you show up for a week of, of spring training, and then you go play in the All-Stars. So they're used to, to showing us that what they do is actually very hard, because it is. But we don't see writers as they work. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 52 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always is my co-host, the Chewie to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, my dear MJ Kuhn. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Adrian? I'm <laughs> good. Thank you. A uh, quick note for everyone out there listening or watching, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live, so check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the FanFighter YouTube channel where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. And now, joining us once again is none other than Sue Burke, author of Semiosis, Immunity Index, and more. Welcome back, Sue. How's it going? Great to be here. Thanks. Oh, pleasure. Heads up, this is part two of our two-part chat with Sue, so I recommend checking out part one to get to know her better. Today, though, we'll be tossing out the script with a mini masterclass on revision and rewriting. So Sue, as a writer, what does revision and rewriting mean to you and how important is this process for you and your work? Um, it's an uh, essential part of, of writing for me. Um, I should mention to readers, I have actually been writing f um, f since 1973 as a professional, or 72, excuse me. Um, so I'm just used to the process, but I came at it as a journalist. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you do as a journalist is you write something and, and you try to get it right, and then you send it to an editor, and then they might change things. They edit it. They may come back to you. They may not. It depends upon how close you are to deadline. Because if there's on a mm -hmm. deadline, you just go through and you deal with it. Um, <laughs> or they come back and they have changes. So I'm used to the idea of, of changing or having your words changed mm -hmm. um, for one reason or another. And, and um, for the most part, the editors that I've worked with have actually been very good. And they've taught me things. They've improved my work. They've helped me improve my work. So it's always been part of what I do. Um, if I turn something in and no one come, the editor doesn't come back and ask for anything. I'm like, well, there oh, must be something on? so I, wrong that they can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so rewriting is writing. And then I've been an editor for a long time too. So I've looked at it the other way and, you know, writers make mistakes and that's fine. And you, you my job as the editor was to make my writers as good as they could be because their byline on it was, was not my byline. Mm -hmm. So I wanted them to be the best them that they could. Um, so it's a process that has just always been with me. Um, I think for newer writers, if something is well written, it's easy to read. And so it should feel, it feels like, well, it should be easy to write. And mm -hmm. it's not. In fact, the better it is, probably the harder it is to write. <laughs> um, I was thinking about this, and, and athletes have taught us very well that being an athlete is difficult, and they have to practice, and they do things. And, you know, it's not like you show up for a week of, of spring training, and then you go play in the All-Stars. Um, so they're used to, to showing us that what they do is actually very hard, because it is. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't see writers as they work, usually. Um, one advantage of the newsroom is I could see Linda sweating as she was working. Um, Poor Linda. <laughs> um, 
but people don't see that and they don't realize how hard it is to work and all the stuff that Linda had to do to get things to where it was good enough to turn into me. And then I said, oh, Linda, you forgot this. Um, so I'm used to it being work and I expect it to be work. And I'm lucky enough that I like to work hard at this kind of work. Mm -hmm. There's other jobs that are very nice that I don't want to do because I don't want to work that hard at that thing. <laughs> yeah. But I want to work hard at this thing. Um, I like to work hard at writing. Um, but not any harder than I have to because I want to write more stuff. And if I get caught writing something, rewriting something forever, then I can't do anything else. So I, I, I'm used to the process. Um, I'm used to having to work as I write. And I've found ways to streamline the work. It never gets easier. But hopefully you make more sophisticated mistakes as you go along. I love that. Sophisticated I love mistakes. that. Yeah. Well, and I, I like, uh, so let's, let's dive into the streamlining a little bit. Cause I want to talk about workflow. I am a big, <laughs> I, I am, have publicly <laughs> said many times, I hate writing my first draft. I, I hate it. It's the worst part. People that are like first drafts are the best part. I'm like, what, uh, what are you on? Where can I get some? Uh, cause for me, the rewriting <laughs> is the writing, right? My first draft is a giant pile of jumble garbage and I need to fix it. Um, do you approach your first drafts the same way? Like, do you write your first draft expressing, like expecting that it's going to be a mess that you're going to need to heavily revise later? Like what's your process look like for that first draft? Oh, I hate first drafts. Um, <laughs> I literally bribe myself. I 500 like more you. words and you can have a cookie. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I find them very difficult. What I am getting better at is um, understanding that they're provisional and getting very comfortable with that and possibly too comfortable <laughs> because um, in in the book that I have coming out, Dual Memory, there's a whole part where I just wrote, insert exciting sea battle here. And then I just kept going because <laughs> I knew one, I it was, and I wanted to get to the part oh, I, uh, that was more interesting later on. Can't get complicated. But, just. I know. I always hate post or past MJ when I do that to myself, though, because I've definitely done that too. <laughs> like, well, I also it. write myself uh, little notes that note to self, dear self. I'm really sorry about what I just and <laughs> what I'm dumping on you, but um, I'm word vomit. <laughs> um. So yeah, I, I do write exploratory first draft um as one of the differences between journalism is that you because you have to work fast you have a, a set plan of what you need to do and how you need to do it and not too many choices just because you don't have the time but you have the time here so you can do all sorts of exciting and different things you can try things out you can be bold and you know what happened what would if they all turned into birds in this scene well that wouldn't <laughs> well maybe it would lurk. let's try um so um i i play with that my first drafts i wouldn't call them shitty drafts although they can be very bad <laughs> but they're um they're the first path through this jungle and, and they may take chronic steps. I don't really care mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah, I wrote it. I'm just going to go back and pretend further earlier on that this and this is, this happened. These people are dead. And now we're just going to keep writing. Um, <laughs> I, cause I'll fix it later. Um, so yeah, my first drafts are pretty rough, but I think that that's a good way to, to approach the problem mm -hmm. of, you have to invent something totally new. I can fix anything, but inventing things are hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I agree. How has this relationship, because you kind of explained it to me as like a plodding, panting hybrid approach where, you know, you are doing a lot of this exploratory writing and then you come back and you're fixing up a lot of things from the first draft and into the revision stages and everything. How has this approach developed over time? for you? Um, to some extent, even going back when I was writing in, in journalism, I thought, I think of journalism as first I do the research and then I organize the research mm -hmm. and then I write it and 
it comes out more or less as I had hoped because I've done good research. Mm -hmm. I look at the first draft as research. And when you're doing research, you can go off in odd odd directions. You realize you don't know something. You have to go back. Um, Research is an art into itself, and it is not one direct line. So this first draft, the zero draft, um, is an investigation more than it is anything else. And you'll have some blind leads. You'll have some stuff that you never did find out that you wish you did. Um, so my first draft is is something of an exploration, something of, of research, figuring out what I didn't research that I wanted to. Um, and then I can use that to start to, to do iterations. One of the interesting ideas I got about how to do that is I don't try to pants. I do try to work often of an outline and a plan. Mm-hmm. But once it's done, to re-outline the whole thing to figure out what I have ah, and cool. which way I should go back, and then to start to evaluate it. And there's a whole lot of tools that you can use to do that. Um, one thing I did on a, a scene that I was having trouble with was I knew how it was going to end. And then I started to work backwards through that. So what was going to take me there and what logically would get me to the next step and work backwards that way? Mm. Um, Most of what I had was okay, but in the wrong order for what I wanted to do Um, because it was a shitty first draft and I was writing whatever (laughs) I felt like. Um, So that's one of the things you can can do. Um, You can also write a shitty first draft in some very different ways. For example... What if you you can do a dialogue-only draft? And people who, for whatever reason, are very good at dialogue, and then fill the rest of it in later. Mm -hmm. Um, You can do disconnected scenes. I sometimes do write a scene that I really want to get done and then figure out how to connect the dots. And that will work just fine, too. Um, You can write NaNoWriMo um style and just write as fast as you can and deal with everything later <laughs> um, uh, so and try all sorts of other things well what if you've been writing along and it's in first person you're not really satisfied with that for various reasons mm-hmm. let's do a couple scenes in third person does that work what if you did it in present tense and not past tense um, and then when you get done and make a decision, then you can rewrite everything because you're going to rewrite it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, first drafts for me are very, very hard, but I want to earn my cookies. And so I do fun <laughs> things. <laughs> I love that. So I need to add more cookies into my process. That's what it's I'm all about the cookies. I love that. MJ, just curb the McDonald's, replace it with <laughs> You cookies. just replace them with cookies when I'm drafting. Mm-hmm. I'm here for it. I love it. <laughs> oh, good. All right. So um, I wanted to ask you your, you know, you've been explaining these different methods that you that you have and everything, but have you found that your revision process is the same each time or have you changed and adapted it with each project and and kind of worked with that flow dependent on what that project offers in terms of challenges and and all that kind of all that kind of stuff yeah it it is different from every project well um there's always a problem but i don't know what the problem is going to be and so i have to go the tools that will be solving that problem. There's a short story I'm writing now. The plot is okay, but the character isn't totally wrong. And her motivation is totally wrong. So I need to go back and work on her as a character. Um, But I don't need to mess with anything that actually happens, because that's okay. Um, So it might be the character. Sometimes the voice is just not right. Or it's shifting from scene to scene. And um, I might make a little chart of how this person speaks, what they say, long, short sentences, and then use that as a guide as I go through that I can. I usually don't need to refer to it once I've done it, because by then I that's one way to, to work through it so that it's now un, I understand it. Mm-hmm. But formally, 
write down what I'm supposed to be doing and then do it. Um, pacing, the part I've been working on in the novel I'm writing now has all been pacing and figuring out when things happen. Um, I know there's this big dramatic thing. What would be the most dramatic moment for it before or after the rest of it? But if it's after this, then what about this? And mm. so you know, it's been trying to build this little Tetris out of various pieces. Um, but that's all pacing. The The characters are okay. It's just what are they doing and when are they doing it? Um, so every time. But what I've done all these years, and, and I study writing as well as studying English and studying everything else, um, is to try to pick up new skills, new ideas. Someone else has the way that they do it. Mm -hmm. And I might not use that until all of a sudden I have the problem. And that seems to be the right tool. Yeah. It's always like this thing that exists in the back of your mind that you've just kind of like subsumed <laughs> over the course of your life of learning and, and just picking up on, on different, uh, skills and, and different things that you've read and just being like, Oh yeah, that's going to help this so much. <laughs> Cause then you just <laughs> dig yourself into a hole until you find that little, that little, just like glimpse of hope that you can <laughs> use as like, you know, the first rung in a ladder to get you out of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love it. So we talked about, you talked about character arcs and you look through, you know, for consistency and all of those things. Uh, are there any other things that you like if you if you're trying to give advice to someone who's looking to revise or begin their revision process like what are some things that they should make sure that they're looking for like aside from even just character arcs you know is there any nitty gritty things that you're like oh this is something that people always forget to look for <laughs> um i think what you need to start with is a big picture of what are you trying to do. For example, mm. if it's a romance novel, they tend to have a, a pretty much of a structure, and that's going to be a structure-driven story. And you need to make sure that it fits within the structure, but as seamlessly as you can. Because um, romance readers are a sophisticated group. Yeah. Um, if it is more of a literary style of story... Um, then you can experiment more with, with the writing as it is. The writing does not need to be transparent. Um, the characters are usually much more developed and the pacing won't be as important there as if you're writing a thriller because a thriller really, you need to have more things happening and keep raising questions and not answering them again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Um, so the more you know about what you're trying to write first place and then use that to make sure that you fulfilled what you're trying to do. I'm not saying write your formula. Um, I will caution against writing to formulas <laughs> unless you're doing certain kinds of work, in which case, yeah, you do have to write the formula. We, we did end the other episode before this on be bold and experiment. Yeah. But <laughs> yes. <laughs> unless you're writing a Marvel comic universe movie, in which case, you know the plot. Yeah. <laughs> um, Don't be bold. Don't experiment. Um, <laughs> but they do a lot of other things in that, which are important to a Marvel comic universe movie. Uh, and they know what they're doing really, really well. Because mm -hmm. they make a lot of money, which is proof that they're doing something right. I watch them, so. Right. <laughs> um, so no, the more you know about what you start going in, the better that will help you. One of the things I also do is I have some cheat sheets. Um, for example, I have a, a list of decreasing tension and increasing tension. And what mm. can you do? For example, um, if you want to decrease the tension, you have a character alone with their thoughts. If you want to increase the tension, put them in there with two other people. You get three people going in a scene, and it is just unstable. It's a three-body problem. Um, uh, do you want to decrease the tension? A big picture, long shots, some, some landscape. And sometimes you want to do that. You want to have a, a more relaxed moment. Mm -hmm. If you want to make things tense, if you get in really, really close. 
Um, it the closer you get, the scarier it is. Uh, so I have you know, lists of things and hints that I keep in a little notebook, and I look at them um, and compare them to what I'm trying to do and things that I have learned over time will help me. Um, I know some of writing software might be able to produce these things for you too. And if it can, then that's great. Um, if not by a three ring binder, um, they're really wonderful tools too. Um, and, um, that will help you as well. So I look for all the help that I can and I try to keep it so that I can find it again when I need it. Mm -hmm. Or if you're like MJ, you can always get like Microsoft Excel and <laughs> do things that way. Every episode. You can do that. We should, um, get a, we should get Microsoft as a, as a sponsor. As a sponsor for the show. For the show. <laughs> I know, right? And, I did have one there, note retweet me once because I was praising <laughs> their tool. Yeah, one, one, one note is an excellent tool for doing yeah. that sort of thing. It is. It's very helpful. See, Adrian, yeah. it's not just me. No, I just mm -hmm. like to bug you. It's okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, yeah, I like that you, I like that you kind of, uh, honed in on, on things like genre and it's like, if you're writing to a certain audience, kind of think about like what your intentions are and how you can further hone those intentions into something stronger and stronger through the revision process. And, um, we will get back to, uh, sort of like formats and, and, and ways that you can, uh, approach the revision process. But before we get into that, I wanted to ask you about how for you personally how ruthless do you have to be with your own words and i know there's this common saying of like kill your darlings and i think it's really effective sometimes it's a necessary evil when we often become so attached to the ideas we put on the page that it's like if it's not working just accept the fact Gotta that you have to get it. rid of it yeah and you'll get a cookie and it's all good <laughs> <laughs> i've thrown out whole books um, that just, this is not a good idea and I'll do something else. I mean, as a reporter, you get sent out an assignment, you come back and say, well, no, there's nothing happening there. Yeah. Give me something else to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I try not to get attached, too attached to what I do so that I can throw it away or reviews it or whatever, anytime I want. I also do not ever erase anything there's a lot living on my hard drive that maybe yep. someday i'll figure out why was that novel not good and what can i use it for mm -hmm. you can go back and mine your own work um and at least take out a scene or take out a character and reuse them it's not theft if you're stealing from yourself. I know. I like how you say mine. It. It, I'm going to start using that because I always say I cannibalize my old drafts and that sounds so much more violent. <laughs> like, but I do, you know, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's just all the plant talk, MJ. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, it's, it's gotten me in a murderous <laughs> mindset for anyone that didn't listen to part one. I'm not just crazy. It's from part one. Um, yeah. So it's on the same note as killing your darlings. How I often do this where I'm editing and revising and revising, and there's always something you can change. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, how do you know when to say, okay, I'm done, that's it, I'm finished, and then you don't touch it anymore and you send it off? <laughs> what's your, what's your a deadline? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. The best answer. <laughs> I love that. To the very end. <laughs> yeah, to the bitter end. I feel mm -hmm. you. But it's like, I, 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 Okay, put yourself in, in the mindset of like a self-published author who all of their deadlines are self-imposed um, unless they booked an editor or something yeah. like that. And then it's like, okay, that's my deadline. Um, do you have like a sense of when you could tell yourself, okay, like Sue, just, just fucking stop it. Like it's, we're <laughs> it's done. Time to call it. We're done. <laughs> it's time to call it. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and and that's a good point. When do you stop making what? When do you start making changes that are not important to it? Yeah. And so you change red to scarlet, and then you change scarlet back to red, <laughs> and then you add some some commas, and then you take them out. You're not really improving it anymore. Mm -hmm. And when you when you've run out of ideas of what to do to make it better, you either try to sell it or you workshop it to figure out what you missed. And sometimes you didn't miss anything. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, when you run out of ideas, then you're done too. Yeah. I love that. Like if, if you're just doing things pointlessly, it's like, okay, mm-hmm. let's, let's call it at that. But I'm, I'm, I want to get your craziest, most over the top revision process you've ever tried or heard of someone else trying MJ had a, you can explain it better than <laughs> yeah. I can. You had a yeah, well, cause okay. I just like, I, I, I was thinking of this question because like I had a time where I've, I've ripped apart a lot of my drafts, but this one in particular, I literally broke every scene down into a color coded note card. And I had like 300 of them because I wanted to rearrange stuff and I wanted to change POVs. And like, I, that was the only way I could conceptualize to like fully overhaul this book. Um, and I was just curious if you ever, and I've never done that in a revision before or since. <laughs> and I just, and, but it worked great for that project. So I'm just curious if you have a story of like the most over the top one that you had to do to make something work. <laughs> um, well, I do use note cards, color coded note cards. So yeah. I don't think I've gotten up to 300. Um, <laughs> I then dropped them on my floor, by the way, and they all went out of order, and it was the worst day. <laughs> Thorin just walked all over oh, them. So so messed it up even more. <laughs> but yes, okay, so note cards. I love it. It's so helpful because then it's very modular. You can move stuff around. And- I have I have note cards here on a, on a, <laughs> a cork board mm-hmm. behind me. I love it. But I have made spreadsheets of what's going on, particularly in Immunity Index, because there were four, eventually five point of view characters, Mm -hmm. and it was all happening in just a short period of days, and we were switching back from one to another. And that was really hard. I wrote that book from beginning to end nine times to try to make everything work smoothly. And so then I do something and it wasn't quite right. And then I make some charts and graphs and then I try again. Um, so yeah, nine times wow. it was painful. Um, but I was also under lockdown. So what else did I have to do? Um, <laughs> Captive audience. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of my goals in life is to not do that again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it was I think the book works because you had all those characters and they're all moving at the same time. And it's something you also see very often in Marvel comic universes. First there's Doctor Strange doing this and then that, and they move back and forth to a scene. And I know that's hard Mm. for them to do because they explain what they're doing too. And it's a process similar to mine is that you just have to keep working that script or keep working that manuscript until it all fits together seamlessly. Um, And my advice to beginning writers is try not to have five characters doing the same thing at the same time, because it's really, really hard. Um, Although if you can do it well, Marvel Comic Universe wants to talk to you. Um, (laughs) So that was tricky. If you have just one character in your whole novel, that will save you from a lot of rewriting. Yeah. that uh, from not from mistakes you made, but just because you have to build that jigsaw puzzle. Yes. Sync the timelines up and all of it. Yes. And that's something (laughs) to think about. If Mm -hmm. you want to write quickly, some things are harder than others. If you have just one character, it will be a much faster process. It'll still be hard, but it won't have that kind of difficulty. You'll have different challenges. (laughs) But if you want to write a thriller, want something to work really fast, then if you can switch back and forth, um, that makes the plot move much quicker. Mm. Yeah. And one of the things I did in there um, is that I wrote my very first draft, and it was 50,000 words. And my contract count called for 96,000 words. (laughs) And so I have a problem. Um, So I got some very, very strong dark coffee and decided I was going to solve this problem Um, and thought about different ways to do that. And what I did was I added a character. That's where the character Peng comes in there. There's four sisters and then there's this other guy. Um, One of the, and so, okay, so I'm going to add another character. What do I want that character to do and what can this character do that's going to be worth like 40,000 words? Um, <laughs> so this was some real strategic having to plan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it worked because I made it work. 
because I kept rewriting until it did. Um, <laughs> and there's not, it's not like there's some platonic ideal story out there. You can build a story from whatever parts you want. Mm -hmm. And if you'd use p different parts, you would have to come up with a totally different story and they would both be good stories. So I had to make a good story from what I had. Um, so he would just be coming at the situation entirely differently, but he could inform it because he had different information about what was going on than what these sisters were doing was they were just yeah. trying to cope with the situation yeah. and he had some perspective to it. So that's how I solved that problem was I did a new person with some new perspective. It might've worked as a 40,000 word story, but then Tor would have been angry with me. Um, <laughs> And I needed to do a much a novel because writers readers also want to have a novel that's uh, approximately this size. So, yeah, that was how I solved that problem. I love it. I love it's it. So I know. Well, and it's it is fascinating. The thing was know. so much fun to work with because he was a, he was just a, if you've read it, he was just a fun character and very very self reflective. Mm -hmm. I do feel like that like just speaks to the fact that rewriting is writing, though, because it's such a beautiful part of the story. It's an element that you clearly love of the story, and it mm -hmm. wasn't a part of the like original first draft. You know what I mean? I think that's – I don't know. I love revising. I think that's a beautiful mm -hmm. way to frame that. Well, that's that. where the magic happens. Yeah. Yeah. That's where you – like you, you mentioned at the beginning where it's like people don't necessarily see the process behind a book. And no one ever, I doubt there's anyone who ever publishes a first draft. Um, Probably maybe someone. there's just some crazy <laughs> wizard writer out there, but they don't see the process behind it. And it's like the first draft is not the best version of the story that you can produce. And so the revision and the rewriting is the time when you can go in there and really hone it down into the best possible version of itself that it can be, at least like enough that you're satisfied with it and publishers are satisfied with it or readers are satisfied with it, et cetera. And, and everyone does this. The, I, I think that, that the farther along in, in the process, you get the more. I saw um, once for Toy Stories, the, the writers of that showed some of the outtakes that they did. When they were exploring the story, they could not get the character of the cowboy right Mm. And they would like do whole scenes and they would be fully illustrated. And Tom Hanks would come and you know, he does not work for free. Right. They spent a lot of money making a scene and going, this sucks. Yeah. We made a mistake. This is totally wrong. We have to keep working. Um, fortunately, they had budgets. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But what we have is patience. Yeah, I feel like that's going to be what my mantra is going to be every time I cut a scene that doesn't work. It's like, well, at least I didn't have to bring in Tom Hanks. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> yeah, nice guy, but not cheap. No, but like, no. You know, I didn't have to pay anyone for this. All I lose is my own time. <laughs> like, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, I feel like that's a happier way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. I love it. Well, OK, we talked a little bit about note cards. Um, do you have any? So when you revise and tear apart your work. Do you always use note cards? Do you have some other things? Like I like to switch back and forth. Sometimes I print out the draft, sorry trees, and I write on it with pens. <laughs> but you know, it just, it, I feel like it gives me mm -hmm. a different view of it when I see it on a printed page and I'm, t mm -hmm. you know, tactile writing. Um, or do you have a computer program that you tend to use sometimes? Like what are, what are your tools and, and processes? I, I do like to print things out. Um, and one of the reasons I like to do that is I can get a much bigger picture because I can lay things out and I can compare pages. Um, even the biggest computer screen that I've had is not as big as my dining room table. Um, <laughs> so I can do more working around. And I'm old enough that when cut and paste started you literally had a series scissors yeah. and You're scotch of... tape and you <laughs> cut stuff and you worked it around but i want to recommend this as a way to do it because uh if you i've done scenes and in, in the dialogue is just not quite right so print it out take the dialogue chop it all up rearrange it do stuff and sometimes the problem solves itself really easily that way yeah, it's like, uh, this is like your journalist mind speaking, laying everything out on the dining room table, all the research mm -hmm. and everything. 
Um, but I like that, you know, it's kind of like honing in on, on like what we as adults tend to lose as we get older and older. And that's the fun of things like the, the childlike wonder of just cutting paper and just gluing stuff together and <laughs> taping and it. And colored like, pens. Yeah, man. It's like, yes. it's like turning it into an arts and craft project. And the, like you said, MJ, it's like printing it out gives you that new perspective and like cutting out is like literally cutting your darlings and just like <laughs> just moving that stuff around and being more tactile with your story, I think is a, is a really good thing just to give you a new perspective on everything that's going on. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, um, Sue, what would be a final piece of advice that you would offer to other writers out there who may be preparing for revision? or deep in the revision trenches, as many of them surely are. <laughs> um, be patient with the process. You're not going to do it all at once, um, but trust the process and just keep moving forward. I love okay. that. Yeah. All right, people, be bold, be patient, because we're writers and we need that room to be able to experiment and to be able to... Yeah, One more just... thing. If it's not fun, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, though. Because we got into this because we love it, right? Sometimes it's yeah. easy mm -hmm. to forget that. <laughs> yeah. Deep down, we're all nerds. We all love writing. We all love science fiction and fantasy. So love what you do. And Sue, thank you so much. That's it for this mini masterclass on our two-parter with Sue Burke. Thank you again for taking the time to chat with us and sharing your insights on revision and rewriting and all that. As well, for anyone who contributes to our Patreon at $10 or more a month, there will be an exclusive reading by Sue from Dual Memory, so go check that out. Sue, where can people find you online? Um, the best place to look is at my webpage. It's S-U-E-B-U-R-K-E -E at, it's, no, S-U-E-B-U-R-K-E -E dot site, S-I-T-E. Fantastic. And I will link to that in the description below, so anyone can just click on that and find all of Sue's work. You can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram and Twitter at SFF Addicts Pod, or you can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. MJ, what about you? Yeah, you can find me across all the main socials, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, at MJ Kuhn Books, all one word. Excellent. Now, keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts. <laughs>